Good morning, church. So good to be speaking to you again. I pray that this morning that you will be blessed. And uh, we're coming into a, a new time, a new series that we're doing. And it's absolutely great to be talking to you again. Well, one thing that COVID uh, has done, I think, is that it has destabilized our sense of, of the normal life. And um, so that's, that makes us nervous. It's, uh, some of us, we don't mind it, but others of us, it's like, where are we going next? Um, we hear people talking about normal or new normal. Uh, that's because we want to find a foothold. We want to find a place where we can hold on and, make, and, and, and climb that cliff, you know. Um, but I, I wonder this morning whether you've thought about what's the God normal? What's the God normal? Because that's not necessarily a new normal or an old normal. It's a different normal. And so next five weeks, we're going to be talking about foundations. We're going to be talking about how to find the right foundation. And um, one of the things that uh, we take for granted in as a foundation is this, church. How is church a foundation? Come with me to Matthew 16. Uh, 15 to 18. Matthew 16, 15 to 18. So Jesus um, takes his, his team to this grotto uh, at Caesarea Philippi, which was a place where, um, where various gods were worshipped. And uh, actually it was uh, known to be or believed to be the entrance to the underworld. In other words, not a real nice place, kind of spooky world, spooky place to be at. So he asked them, who do you say that I am? And in verse 16, Simon Peter answered and he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So we get to that place and we often stop there and um, we say, well, that's it. That's what, I, that's what I need to believe. That's right. Amen. But that's not where Jesus stops. What does he say next? In verse 18, he says, And I also say to you that you are Peter. He speaks to Simon Peter and he reminds him not just of who he was born as, but who he was born to be. Peter, it means little rock. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Jesus was saying that the rock on which he was going to build something called church was the very rock on which he was standing, a pagan shrine to the dead. He says, even this pagan shrine to the dead is not going to prevail against what I want to do uh, through what you've just said and through you. Now, I want to read to you um, a, a quote from um, a guy called Simon Chan. He's quoting another guy, D.T. Niles, and he says this. We often say that the answer to the problems of our world is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Can I say to you with reverence that the answer to the problems of our world is not Jesus Christ? Oh, wow. He says the answer to the problems of the world is the answer that Jesus provided, which is the church Jesus Christ has set in the world. Can you see where I'm going today? I want to talk to you about a foundation and I want to talk to you about a big answer that Jesus provides. He says a community bound to him, sharing his life and his mission and endured with the power of the Holy Spirit. This community is the answer Jesus has provided for the evils of the world. What a profound and powerful thought that is. What a challenging thought that is, that the church, the little old church, our little old church might be the answer that Jesus has provided even in this moment, even in this crisis moment. So we're going to talk about why this is so. Jesus is going to build church and it will defeat hell itself. And that thought is a foundation for God's normal. 1 Timothy 3, 14 to 15, Paul says this, These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed... I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, 
the pillar and ground of the truth. Now, I have a question for all of us. And the question is, what is your pillar and ground of the truth? Because right here, Paul says, it's church. It's church. Now, <laughs> to be honest with you, at times I'm like, what? How could that possibly be the case? But Paul says it is. The word church is a translation of the Old Test. In the Old Testament, they translated the Hebrew Old Testament to the Greek Old Testament, and they translated the word people of God as church. So the word church means the people of God. In John 1.14, we're told that, that um, when Jesus came into the world, the word... All the ideas that God wanted to communicate became flesh and dwelt among us, dwelt among us. Now, that means that all word, all truth from God is no good until it becomes embodied in a group of people. And that's what church, that's what, how church and truth can connect, that, that truth gets connected to a group of people and is lived out in, in our lives together. Now, how many of you like Amazon? I know I do. In this season, I've been going pretty crazy on Amazon uh, because I've been getting a lot of books for my master's program that I'm doing at the moment. And it is so easy to get books on Amazon. It's just find, point, click, pay or Kindle. That's even better. You just, just pay for it and boom, five minutes later, there's the entire book on your Kindle. I love that. Efficient and instant. But knowledge of God and his life is nothing like that. We get used to that kind of situation where we can just download information so easily. I know, wouldn't it be awesome if you could just download the things you need to know about God like that? No, it's not like that at all. What if real life is a participation in the body of something? What if real life requires us to dwell together? What if real life requires us to actually not just get the information, but to walk it out and work it out as a community of people embodied? My boys um, love playing those shooter games on uh, PlayStation 4. Um, I, I don't really like them, um, but it's not because they're violent. I mean, goodness me, the cross of Jesus Christ is violent I mean, <laughs> it's not because they're violent that I don't like them. It's because they're not real. I don't like them. I mean, what happens in these games is, is you run around um, like boys always have done all their lives, um, you know, pointing sticks at each other and things like that. Now they're actually doing it on a screen. But you die and then you respawn. And um, what I don't like is that war, real real war, real 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 situations where people are shooting at one another is nothing like that. You know, in war, um, you make friends with all of your mates and you're working together. But when your mates die, they're gone. No respawn. It's not real. They're gone forever. And virtual, virtual is not the real thing. It's just a copy of the real thing. Just a, just a not very good copy, actually, of the real thing. I want to suggest to us that that in our world, we've got a lot of virtual stuff happening, but virtual is never the real thing. Because in virtual, you risk nothing and you gain nothing. All you do is experience something, but it doesn't grow you in any way. You can just switch it on or switch it off when you feel like it. And you stand outside of reality, stand outside of yourself. And that's, that's kind of like sometimes how we treat what God wants to do in our lives. But you can't get God in that way. Look at what Paul says in verse 15 of, of um, 1 Timothy 3. He says, I write to you, I write to you so that you may know, that's no knowledge, how you ought to conduct yourself. And then he says, in the house of God. I want to write to you because I want to influence you so that you may know how to actually live this out in the house of God, in the house of God. The house of God, why would he use that expression? What's that all about? Well, 
The house of God is the place that God lives in. The house of God is the place of God's presence. God's presence. That's what he's thinking about. He's saying, I want to train you so you will know how to live near God. Wow. You see, being a Christian is not just about a bunch of of beliefs that I have. It's about living near God. It's about walking with God. It's about the spirit of God in me. Now, God is everywhere, but not everyone is near God. And that goes for, for church as well. You might say, I believe certain things, but it doesn't mean that you're near God and God is near you. He might be near you, but you're not very aware of his nearness and how that nearness is affecting how you live your life. Church is living together near God. And that is something that we learn and we learn it for the rest of our life. Learning to live near the presence of God. Now, what I want to do, that's just setting you up for the next five weeks. What I want to quickly do today before we finish is uh, begin to talk today about church as a foundation, as a people that are on mission. To, to, to get what church is and to get that foundation in us, we need to realise that we are a people on mission. You ever been part of a, uh, a team that didn't really know where it was going? I remember uh, when I was a teenager, my mum got me this job working for this greengrocer um, and um, you know, being who I am, I always want to try and improve things uh, in, a, in a business or in who I'm working for. And I used to talk to this greengrocer every Saturday and say, hey, maybe we should do this or maybe we should do that. And uh, this guy used to come back to me every single time and he'd say, don't get excited, son. Don't get excited, son. You see, the, <laughs> the guy who owned the business, he just wanted me to show up and clean up. He didn't want me to change anything or, or help in any way. Just show up and clean up. And, you know, if, you think, if we think that that's what uh, God is all about in our life, that's not what he's like at all. I mean, working without purpose is so demotivating. And for so many people, being alive can be so demotivating because of the sense of what am I here for? But um, when Jesus comes into our life, We begin to work with purpose. We begin to be on mission. We begin to understand where we're going and what we're supposed to be doing. And that brings restoring. That brings restoration into our life, not not demotivation. We already said uh, that Jesus said here, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. They shall not, not just... They're coming against us, but we're pushing forward against them and they will not withstand what God is doing through his church. Now, that's a mission. That's a purpose. That's, that's a sense of doing something, advancing together with a mission. So what's the mission and why do I need, uh, what do I need to do for the mission? Number one is we need to realise that the mission is continuing Jesus' mission. Our mission is to continue Jesus' mission. And so that's really important. In Acts chapter 1, verse 1, we see this. Luke wrote this and he said, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles. Now he says, the former account, the former account. That's the gospel of Luke. He wrote the former account, which is the gospel of Luke, and then he wrote the sequel, which is Acts. And as some people say, we're still in the sequel because Acts doesn't really finish at, at chapter 29. Um, they are both about Jesus and what he began to do. Not what he finished, but what he began to do. And part two, three and four is what we continue to do. Uh, you are the continuing mission of Jesus. How awesome is that? What a big idea that is. So what is that about? Well, It's about doing and it's about teaching. They go together. It's not just about teaching and it's not just about doing. It's about doing and teaching, which is why God can never be only up here. Never. If it's up here, it's got further to go. It's got to go down here and then it's got to go down here and it's got to go down here and then it has to go 
out there into the community of the church. Church is Jesus' mission. Now, one picture um, used in the New Testament about church is about joining an army. And uh, in 2 Timothy uh, 1, verses 3 and 4, um, in verse 4, uh, Paul says to Timothy this, No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Now, here's a thought, just one thought. Are you on mission? If you're not on mission, you may be entangled in another mission, which means all you have to do is ask God to unentangle you. And once you get unentangled from the other missions, you can actually step into being on Jesus' mission. That's a very simple thought there. Jesus unentangles your mission. Second thought is that he says we should be baptised or immersed in the Holy Spirit, in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Uh, verse 4, Acts 1. Being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, John baptised with water, but you shall be baptised or immersed with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So the second picture we get is that baptism or immersion in the Holy Spirit needs to happen to us. Let me, let me say something about that. Nobody in the Bible is ever given the Holy Spirit to sit around and become a better person. If you've been told that, that that's the purpose of the Holy Spirit, not in the Bible. When in the Bible, two things happen to people when they're immersed in the Holy Spirit or anointed with the Holy Spirit or touched by the Holy Spirit. The first thing is that the Holy Spirit places you in the divine presence. The second thing is that the Holy Spirit empowers you to act with divine influence. So the Holy Spirit places us in the divine presence and the Holy Spirit causes us to be, to be empowered with divine influence. That's why if we're going to be the church and we're going to be on mission in the same way as Jesus was, we need to be, have those two things. We need to be in the divine presence and empowered for divine mission. Roger Stronstad, a, um, a, a commentator on Luke and Acts, says, Luke presents Jesus as an anointed prophet, but Acts present, presents the church as a community of prophets. And, you know, <laughs> it's so important for us to realise that to, be, to speak God's words to people, we need to be anointed by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, how do I know that I am? If your team won the grand final... I can guarantee that you would tell me about it. I guarantee it. If your team won the grand final, you'd get so excited and you'd tell me about it. Let me ask, can people tell if we have experienced Jesus ha having been raised from the dead? In the Bible, you can tell that people have experienced that for themselves. God pours out his spirit so people can tell. You can't tell until people can tell. <laughs> that you've been influenced by the Holy Spirit. Are you receiving the fullness of the Holy Spirit? Final thing, as we finish today, is we are to be his witnesses. Witnesses. Verse 8 of Acts 1 says, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses, starting here in Jerusalem, also in Judea, also in Samaria, and even into to taking it globally to the ends of the earth. Now, what's a witness? What a witness is? A witness is someone who tells what they have seen and what they have experienced. That's what a witness is. That's not so hard, is it? To if someone asks you, you know, have you ha have you been to the new shopping complex in in um, Lane Cove, the Canopy, and you go, yeah, I've seen it and I've experienced it. I really like it, or maybe I don't like it. But you're witnessing. Witnessing is not something you just do. It's something you first be. We're to be witnesses before we actually do the witnessing. So it's not something for a few of us. It says witnesses. It's something for all of us. 
something for the whole church. The whole church together witnesses because that's what God intended. So Jesus died to create a community of witnesses. He said, I will build my church and they will be experience my presence and they will be witnesses. The greatest witness is the presence of the spirit-filled community in the community. It's the greatest witness, just us gathering together and being available for people, people being able to see what it's like to, to, to encounter God and how that transforms our life. It's a witness. It's being witnesses. So today, church, we're laying a new foundation. We're getting a sense that, that church is critically important and we're realising that we need to be on mission with Jesus, unentangled from our own mission so we can be in Jesus' mission, baptised in the Holy Spirit and then owning it together as a community so that we can be witnesses. God bless you today. I hope that encouraged you a lot and gave you food for thought. And I can't wait to hear from Pastor Richard Botter next week and Pastor Ben's going to be preaching as well. Can't wait for that. Why don't I pray for you this morning? In Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you for privileging us to continue your mission. Thank you, Lord, for pouring out your spirit. Lord, if we haven't yet received the fullness of your spirit, I pray for everyone who's wanting more. Lord, that you would give us the desire to want more and that we would experience more of your power and your presence in our midst. And Lord, help us to be witnesses, Lord, Every day, every week, every month, every year going forward. In Jesus' name, amen.